So what does my lab do? My lab really tries to accelerate drug discovery in oncology. I'm a clinician, and that's where I started from, and then went into the laboratory um, because clearly the, the therapies that we had for most cancers that I was interested in were inadequate. So how do we do this? Um, very simple philosophy in my uh, opinion. So what we try to do is define targets. Um, these are typically these driver alterations that, that you've heard about for the last few days. We then try to identify a drug that actually effectively inhibits this target. And I, I don't know how much molecular pharmacology was at this meeting, um, but I think this is the key point that many of the geneticists seem to forget, that um, oftentimes we have a very good target, but if the drug is inactive and it doesn't inhibit the target sufficiently, um, oftentimes you can misinterpret your clinical data. And just to point that out, since Keith is in the room, um, there was a very nice plenary session uh, talked by, by Frank McCormick um, at one of the uh, AACR annual meetings, essentially suggesting that BRAF was not a good drug target because serafinib was ineffective um, in, in one of Keith's earlier um, clinical trials that didn't make it into the New England Journal because the drug didn't work. So, so that's a really key point as well. And then really the challenge, and, th and that's what I work on at this point, is really identifying the patients. So how do we identify patients who have alterations in particular drug targets so that we can actually test um, those therapies? So how do we identify the targets? There's really two main ways to do this. One is called a G2P approach or a genotype to phenotype approach. This is what we do most of the time. This is where we take a large cohort of tumors, we retrospectively profile these tumors, looking primarily for things that are recurrent. And so recurrent is a little bit of a surrogate of being important. So if something like BRAF V600E is found in 50% of melanomas, the fact that you see that same exact mutation in half of melanomas just implies that it has to be important. And so then we start working on the functionality of those alterations. And we've seen recent success um, with things like BRAF. And that's really the story that, that changed my career. I was in Neil Rosen's lab working on HSP90, and there's, again, nothing wrong with HSP90. We're still trying to get HSP90 inhibitors into the clinic. We haven't been able to do it over the past 20 years. And then this paper really came out in the summer of 2002. And this is the paper from the Sanger Institute showing for the first time that BRAF was mutated in human cancer. And it was a very simple experiment. It was really a predecessor of the TCGA. All they did was they took 1,000 cancer samples, mostly cell lines, and they did Sanger sequencing of every gene in the MAP kinase pathway. And this is a really low-risk project because we already knew that there was a lot of RAS mutations. And in a worst-case scenario, they were just going to publish a better series of where RAS mutations are found. But unexpectedly, they found that BRAF was mutated um, in human cancer. And this must have been incredibly frustrating for all the people who worked on RAF because they all worked on RAF1. Nobody ever bothered to work on BRAF. That was the other RAF that didn't really do anything. Um, and it turned out that BRAF really was the key mutated target um, in human cancer. They actually mislabeled in the initial Nature paper um, the sequence of BRAF. And so initially, the, the common mutation found in about 95% of, of, of tumors that are RAF mutant um, was called V599E. This is ultimately um, V600E when they, when they corrected this error a couple of years later. Took a few years to get a good drug. That was really key here. Um, you know, we went through serafinib, went through some of the early generation MEK inhibitors, but it wasn't until, and you know, I'm sure you've heard this story many times, until drugs like vemurafenib came along that we're able to see these kind of dramatic response and responses and then ultimately um, prove that there was a survival benefit in patients. So that's the typical approach, and that's not what I'm going to talk about for the first say, 10 minutes of this talk. I'm going to really talk about the opposite. And you've, you've heard, heard some of these. This is what we call the extraordinary um, responder approach or, or N of 1 initiative. And this is where we take patients who have already had a response and we try to figure out what made them genetically unique. And, and the attractiveness um of this approach, someone coming from a molecular pharmacology background, is that we know that already um, the drug is effective at inhibiting the target. It's effective at, inhi at least inhibiting some target that's important in that, in that cancer cell. It may not be the target we thought was important, but at least we know the drug gets in, it does inhibit the target, and at least one patient had an incredibly active uh, response. And so the initial inspiration um, for my uh, deep dive in this area was really this clinical trial. I'm a GU medical oncologist, 
And this was a clinical trial in patients with bladder cancer. Um, a very simple study. We simply took Everolimus, which was already approved in patients with renal cell cancer. We came up with some reason to try this in bladder cancer. We can always essentially try any approved drug in every cancer with some rationale. And unfortunately, like every bladder study that's been done in the last 30 years, this was a negative trial. We've had no new FDA-approved agents um, in bladder cancer since Jim Sidabine about two decades ago. And so there were 45 patients enrolled on the study. Only two of them responded. And so the conclusion was that, that, that Everolimus is inactive in patients with bladder cancer. That is the correct statistical conclusion based upon the pre-study uh, specified endpoint, which in this case was incredibly low. All we were looking for was two-thirds of the patients to be progression-free at two months, two months, which is when you get the first CAT scan. So we weren't looking for cures. We weren't looking for major responses. We just wanted to see if we could get through the first CAT scan in at least two-thirds of the patients, and we couldn't even achieve that. So I can imagine the company looking at this and saying, you know, okay, let's move on to something else. But what really, you know, really intrigued us was this patient. This is actually a patient who presented off the slide here um, to the left of the slide in the summer of 2009 with uh, disease that had already spread to the lymph nodes. And what we try to do in this setting is we try to give chemotherapy, we try to shrink down the cancer, and then we take the patient to the operating room, try to cut everything out, hoping we can cure the patients. And we actually do cure a subset of these patients. But unfortunately for this woman, within a few months, and she was briefly NED, but within a few months by January of, of the next year, um, her cancer had come back. And I don't know if you can see it in the back, but she now had this bulky um, lymphadenopathy. In patients with bladder cancer, there is no standard of care in this setting. The average survival of these patients is only nine months. So we encourage these patients um, to go on clinical trials. So she went on this clinical trial of Everolimus, not for any particular reason that we thought Everolimus would be particularly effective in her, but that was the open clinical trial at the time at Sloan Kettering for patients with bladder cancer. And fortunate for her, she had a partial response by April 2010 and a complete response by July 2010 that was durable at July 2011, 12, 13, 14. Um, this woman is actually still alive, approaching in January the five-year anniversary of starting on this clinical trial. She's, in fact, the only patient of the 45 on the clinical trial who's still alive, showing the poor prognosis of these patients. So what was going on here? Well, I put a clinical fellow on this, and um, we initially ran this, this patient's tumor through our sequinome assay. It was essentially negative. We did a Ray CGH on this patient. It was a completely quiet genome from a structural perspective. We sequenced about 10 genes by Sanger sequencing, couldn't find anything. Fellow was getting a little bit nervous here, you know, a fellowship starting to tick along, really couldn't get anything in this patient. Um, but fortunately for him, actually, we, we were able to tap in the to the technology of actually sequencing this patient's whole genome. So we had a, a working group that was assembled and said, okay, well, up in Boston, they're doing whole genome sequencing. Well, we got to do whole genome sequencing too. So, so you know, who, who's got a tumor? Um, and, you know, people put forward, you know, uh, you know, let's do a couple melanomas, let's do, you know, some prostate cancers. And fortunate for me, the prostate cancers failed QA, um, and the melanomas never showed up. And so we actually put this patient forward saying, you know, you know, why don't we study this patient with bladder cancer? Because we can not only prove we can do whole genome sequencing, which is important, but maybe we can actually solve um, this mystery. So we went ahead and, and we did this whole genome sequence. Um, it turns out that the patient has a complicated genome. Even though we had done multiple assays already, which was really standard of the, you know, uh, you know, of, at the time, um, really, I guess, at the cutting edge at the time, you could even say, um, we missed 17,000 mutations that were in this patient's tumor. So the patient had a lot of mutations. We just weren't looking um, in any of those areas. Um, but we can pretty much very quickly narrow that down to 140 that are in coding regions. And to me, it's a real testament to how much we've learned from the tumor and normal genomes that we can very quickly map all these 17,000 mutations to the normal and tumor genomes and ask which ones are likely related to this woman's response to Everolimus. And when you do all that, it actually becomes obvious. And things that are probably right are always obvious in retrospect. And it turned out that the patient had a two-base pair deletion in TSC1 which causes a frame shift in early truncation. She also had a nonsense mutation in NF2. And the reason these are interesting is because we already knew loss of both of these alterations lead, leads to activation of TORC1, which is the direct target of the drug. So this woman really was the perfect candidate for Everolimus. We simply didn't know it going into the clinical trial. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that uh, given time, um, but we, we did have some data in that paper showing, in all likelihood, the epistatic relationship between the loss of both of those genes likely made this tumor particularly 
um, torque one dependent. We've since gone on and applied this um, to other patients. I would note that for the first patient, um, it cost me $20,000 um, to do the whole genome just for the raw sequencing alone. I actually make the analogy to the Visa commercial, you know, DNA extraction, $100 whole genome sequencing, $20,000, you know, informatics priceless. I mean, you know, because we sat around for about four months analyzing that, that initial um, genome. This one was a lot easier. This is a woman with ovarian cancer, we're still trying to publish this one, um, who had uh, low-grade serious, serious borderline tumors. These are tumors that, that grow much slower than high-grade serious ovarian cancers, but are oftentimes fatal when they, when they spread. And this woman had been through three prior surgeries and three prior um, systemic agents, none of which she responded to um, whatsoever. So she enrolled on a trial, GOG-239, which is a trial of AZD-6244. Um, this is a MEK inhibitor that me and Keith and others had worked on for many years, a kind of disappointing drug, never ultimately um, has gotten approved, maybe, maybe one day. Um, and this was, again, a disappointing study. There were, were total seven, I think, responses on this study. Um, this was the only woman who achieved a complete response, and actually she's still disease-free now over five years later um, with a complete response on, again, this drug that was felt to be relatively inactive. There was a response rate of about 10 percent um, on the clinical trial. And actually, if you go back to the paper that was published on this, the clinical paper, um, there's a note in the discussion saying molecular profiling um, was of no utility in, in determining, you know, why this individual responded um, to, to, to the MEK inhibitor. So what's going on in this patient? Well, it turns out that the patient has a mutation in a gene called MAP2K1. And for, for those who, who don't know all the gene names off the top of your head, MAP2K1 actually encodes for MEK1, which is the direct target of the drug. And you say, well, how do you miss this mutation as part of the clinical trial? Well, the assay they were using very simply didn't have MEK1 in it, so they weren't going to um, detect that. And even if you tried to do older methodologies like Sanger sequencing, it would have been very difficult to detect. And the reason for that is this is actually a 15 base pair um, small in-frame deletion um, that leads to a deletion within the negative regulatory uh, helix um, within MEK1. And, and the other thing to note about these type of tumors is they've got a high amount of stromal contamination. So there was only 8.3 percent of the reads. We had very deep depth on this um, validation um, assay, 725 reads showing this mutation in 60 of them. So it's clearly there, but it's only 8 percent of so of the reads, and that's because there's a lot of stromal contamination that would have made this, you know, being able to detect this by Sanger sequencing essentially impossible. So, you know, the question is, is this an activating mutation? If you go back Back to the lab and you actually make this mutation, compare it to one of the uh, missense mutations we commonly see in, in patients with lung cancer, um, you can see that this is an incredibly activating mutation and this mutation is actually sensitive to the MEK inhibitor. So again, not rocket science. Patient with an incredible response to the MEK inhibitor, why don't we figure out what made that patient unique and we can actually find um, this MEK1 mutation, again implying that this woman was the perfect candidate for this drug. We simply didn't know it going into the clinical trial and maybe we can do trials more rationally in the, in the future once we have this information prospectively. This is a, a, a quick third case. This one actually was the most insightful mechanistically um, that we've done so far. This is a young woman. She was in her early 40s, presented um, with a right ureteral tumor. So ureteral cancers are relatively uncommon. We see a lot of cancers of the bladder and the kidney, but anywhere along the urethelial tract, you can get uh, a cancer. And so she had a primary ureteral tumor. And uh, it was a, a, an isolated uh, primary, and so they went ahead and cut it out. And if you look at it under the microscope, this woman has a pure small cell cancer. So you can get small cell cancers anywhere in the body. They're most common in the lung, but you can see them um, pretty much anywhere. And so this, this is a particularly grim uh, finding, because at least in our series before this patient at Sloan Kettering, every single patient with small cell cancer of the urethelial tract had died of their disease. So this is, these patients simply do not um, do well. And so they actually went ahead and gave her chemotherapy. They gave her cisplatin etoposide, which is the way you would treat a lung cancer patient with small cell, hoping that would prevent her cancer from coming back. And unfortunately, within a few months, her cancer came back. She now had metastasis to the kidneys. She had bulky um, lymphadenopathy. And for some reason, it's still beyond uh, my comprehension, but our surgeons actually took her back to the operating room, tried to cut all this out. There was really nothing else to really do for it. Um, but unfortunately, within a few months, her cancer came back. She had now, again, lymph node metastases, and she actually had bone metastases. So you're looking at this woman, young woman, you know, what are you going to do with this case? Okay, let's refer her to the phase one clinic, um, because we know how often those trials um, are positive. So she went to the phase one clinic. 
And again, for no particular reason, other than it was an open trial at the time, she was enrolled on a study of ear notican and a drug called AZD7762. And this is a selective inhibitor of CHECK1, which you know, is kind of exciting uh, based upon um, some preclinical data. And there's been known synergy um, with ear notican, in, in particular in tumors that are P53 mutation. So she went ahead and she went on this drug and actually achieved a complete response within a few uh, months, but actually had to stop the investigational therapy while she was on the treatment because the company completely discontinued the program. And they discontinued the program because the drug was inactive, okay? So she had a complete response to a drug that the company essentially killed due to lack of activity because she was the only one on the trial um, who had such a response. So we actually kept her on the chemo for a few more months thinking, you know, if we stop the, the drug, her cancer is going to quickly come back. And I would actually point out for the first two cases I described to you, both of those patients actually are still on the drug because it's like a patient with HIV and triple drug therapy. You're so nervous to stop it um, that you just leave the patient on the drug as long as they're willing to tolerate that. But we had to stop the chemo eventually because you can't just keep giving your notican for, uh, forever. And that was about three years ago, and she's NED. So this is a woman who was cured of a cancer that everybody dies of with a drug that was so disappointing that the company discontinued it during the clinical trial. So what's going on in, in this woman? So we went ahead and we, we sequenced her whole genome. This is a circus plot of her whole genome. Um, these lines here are translocations, so she has a lot more structural variations. Um, the inner circle here is copy number variations, and this is the Everolimus pa patient, so a lot of, of copy number uh, alterations. And she's got 17, 000, I mean, 19,000 somatic mutations. So again, very complicated genome. And, and you know, a skeptic could really say, how can you really look through all that and come up with anything um, of utility. But again, there's a lot of tools and a lot of knowledge that's out there that if you mine it and, and run these tools, um, you can glean a lot of insight. So how do we do it? Just, just two quick slides on some of the tools that we use. I, actually, I think I cut one of them given time. Um, one of the things we do is we actually align um, each of the mutations um, um, using a, a, a tool called Mutation Assessor, which compares the site of this mutation to the, this gene um, in mice and, and in yeast and, in, and uh, all the way back to bacteria. And if we see an area where there's a lot of evolutionary conservation, that usually implies um, that that area is probably important and that if you mutate it, you might affect its function. Um, and so there was a mutation in gene called RAD50, which was pretty exciting to us because there was some preclinical data that maybe loss of RAD50 or MRE11 function would actually synergize with check in, check one inhibition and chemotherapy. So this was exciting. There was also a mutation in ATR, which, which again, would have been predicted to do the same thing. Again, another missense mutation. But if you look at this ATR mutation, it's not found in any uh, known functional domain, and there's no evolutionary conservation in, in, in ATR where the mutation exists, whereas in RAD50, it's in this D loop, which is very important um, for the function. And so we went ahead and we actually um, took advantage of this evolutionary conservation to do a cross-species validation of this missense mutation in RAD50 um, using a yeast model. So we went ahead and knocked this mutation into both haploid and diploid yeast. I'm not going to go through the whole story because it was just published in Cancer Discovery. And when you do that and knock it into haploid yeast um, that are otherwise wild type, and here's the equivalent of that RAD50 mutation in yeast, and then you treat with them with CPT11, which is the active metabolite of urinotecan, you can see there's a modest uh, sensitiz sensitization to the drug. Um, but that's actually not the scenario that this patient was treated with. She wasn't just treated with um, the chemotherapy in the setting of having this mutation, she was treated with the chemotherapy and a uh, CHECK1 inhibitor and then got uh, the chemotherapy in the setting of a RAD50 mutation. So to really model the CHECK1 inhibition in the setting of this RAD50 mutation, we actually knocked out the yeast MEK1 gene, which is the yeast equivalent to ATR. And when you go ahead and do that, you see this incredible synthetic lethality between knocking out MEK1 or inhibiting CHECK1 function having this RAD50 uh, missense mutation and giving uh, chemotherapy. Um, so again, in, in retrospect, this patient was the perfect patient um, to get this combination therapy. We simply didn't know her genetics going into the clinical trial. And to be honest with you, with 19,000 mutations, I'm not sure you would have pulled out this missense mutation of RAD50 unless this patient had had a complete response to a CHECK1 inhibitor. So again, using this outlier phenotype, it allows us to again, essentially narrow down you know, what's maybe important in, in this incredibly uh, genetic uh, context. And I would say it's really no different, um, th this concept, uh, than how we found all of the tumor suppressors, essentially. We took patients who had strange outlier phenotypes, people with very young onset cancer or other birth defects, and said, you know, using linkage analysis, can we find a gene 
that actually explains uh, this phenotype. We're simply trying to do the same thing here um, with therapeutics. I would point out one thing, and I'm going to get back to this towards the end, this issue of clonality, which I think you're going to be hearing more and more about. We think one of the reasons this woman had such a great response um, to, the, to the CHECK1 inhibitor with the chemo is that this RAD50 mutation was found in every single cancer cell. So it was a clonal alteration. And overall, she just had very little subclonal architecture, with the hypothesis being if you've got a lot of subclonality within your tumor, maybe you've got some resistant subclones already present, and your odds of being one of these extraordinary long-term responders is probably um, pretty small. So this is really the paradigm. We do an unselected clinical trial. We still do many, many of those. We take patients uh, on these studies. Our focus has been on the studies that failed, um, but take the few patients who responded, do genetics, um, identify alterations that you think are likely um, the molecular basis of those response. You always need to go back to the lab to do functional validation to make, the, make sure these things um, are actually real. I mean, none of the take home message from none of this should be that we should be doing off indication treatment with CHECK1 inhibitors in patients with RAD50 mutations. That's not what we're suggesting. What we're suggesting is that you develop assays to look for these alterations you found in the patients so that you can do an iterative clinical trial to really answer the question when you have this specific set of mutations, do you respond to this specific drugs? Because we doubt that every patient with, for example, a TSC1 mutation is going to respond to Everolimus. We know that's, that's untrue. Um, and we already know that not every patient with an EGFR mutation responds um, to an EGFR inhibitor. So we really need to know what is the response rate and figure out why there's probably variability within that population. So how are we going to go and do those clinical trials? Make a little bit of uh, a change in, in what, we're, what we're talking about over the next 10 minutes. So there's really two main approaches to, to doing these clinical trials. One I call a genotyping study, but it could also be called an umbrella study or the match study um, or molecular allocation study. And really what you do here is you, you really focus except for the MATCH study, which is really a study unique in and of itself, to be honest with you. It's kind of a combination of the basket and the MATCH approach. But you really take one cancer, you know, if, for example, lung cancer, and you profile all the patients with that disease, and then you allocate the patients to different arms, pretty simple, um, depending upon what mutations they have. And you can either straight up allocate them based upon the mutation, or you can do what's called an adaptive randomization, where initially you randomize the patients to different arms, and then if you start seeing greater activity in one of those arms, more and more patients will, will get randomized to that arm. And that allows you to actually uh, determine that not having the biomarker, you know, doesn't work. And, and that sounds great for statisticians. I hate that, but but sounds great for, for statisticians. So what is the problems with this approach? Um, and really, the first really good example of this was the battle study run out of MD Anderson by Roy Herbst. And, and really, to me, the, there's three main problems with the approach, one being that um, the drugs often used are not best in class, but what you were able to get for the study. And so, you know, you've got, if you go back one slide here, you've got to get many drugs for a study like this because you've got to cover as many patients as possible um, because you're spending all this money uh, to actually genetically profile them. That's usually built into the, into the study. And so, you know, if the best BRAF inhibitor you can get at the time is serafinib, you know, you give the patients uh, serafinib. And actually, that was, that's what was done um, for battle one. Even though we knew at that point, Keith had already clearly published, serafinib was not a good um, RAF inhibitor. Um, actually, for battle two, they just made the same mistake. You know, I guess, you know, you keep, you know, they just keep doing the same thing. Um, so for battle two, they used AZD6244 for the BRAF patients. We already knew that wasn't a great MEK inhibitor. Um, and, and so that, that's, that's a major problem. I, I hate the adaptive randomization design. This is really an MD Anderson thing, so I can say that up here in Boston. Um, they love this. Um, the problem with this to me is just I would never want to be adaptively randomized personally. And it actually can become unethical during the course of the study to, to randomize some of the patients. And this happened on the battle study. At some point, you know, when Posse and Jeff and, and Will Powell down in New York um, were publishing an 80, 90 percent response rate with EGFR inhibitors and EGFR mutants, it just became untenable to randomize a patient with an EGFR mutation to serafinib. And they were doing it for a while, and just the pressure built up, and eventually they had to say, okay, fine, if you've got an EGFR inhibitor, we're going to make an exception to the randomization, and we're going to give you uh, Tarceva. That's very nice of them. Um, but um, So I, I don't love the adaptive randomization, but there are big advocates out there, and they're usually statisticians. The, the other point I want to make is that the total number of, of patients in these studies is generally low, 
And thus, the design's not sufficient to find rare variants uh, at sufficiently high frequency to actually sometimes answer your primary question. So if you look at something like lung cancer and BRAF mutations, with the battle study, um, they put about 150 patients on the study. Only 1% of them have BRAF V600E mutations. So if they're lucky, they get two or three. They might get none. Um, they might get one. Um, but you simply don't have enough patients to answer the question that I want to answer, which is if you've got a BRAF V600E mutation and you've got lung cancer, what's the response rate? That's what I want to know. And, and so that, that typically is not answered um, in, this, in this type of trial design. So what's the other approach? Um, the other approach is doing what we call a basket study. And so instead of centering this around the disease, you center the study around a particular mutation or genes, you know, a particular gene. Or for the case of the Everolimus complete responder, the basket study I've always wanted to do is just take patients with TSC1 and TSC2 mutations or NF2. So they could all go into the basket and ask how many of those patients um, respond to Everolimus. And we're almost about to get that study uh, opened with David Kiyakowski from, from Dana-Farber. Um, so essentially, you take all the patients, and here's the BRAF basket study. Anyone can go on the study. It doesn't matter what kind of cancer you have. As long as you don't have melanoma, and you don't need to go on the trial if you have melanoma, because the drug's already FDA approved in melanoma, you just write your prescription for it. But everyone else can go on this study, and we put them all in the same study. And then really, statistically, it's pretty simple. It's just a, a bunch of parallel phase two. So you try to get 15 patients with colorectal cancer, 15 with lung cancer, 15 with breast cancer, you know, on down the line. And I think that the, 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 the thing these studies benefit the most are rare cancers. So we actually didn't know going into the study that we'd find all these patients with Erdheim Chester disease, um, but we always have an other arm on the study. And so any of those patients can go on, and we can actually amend the study over time that if we see a lot of patients with a particular disease, we can add another basket to the study to make sure we get enough of them onto the trial. So there's actually no limit in the number of other patients um, you, you can enroll. And you can sometimes see dramatic responses. This is the first patient with a BRAF, V600E mutation, treated with the brafinib. So although none of the patients with BRAF, V600E mutations with lung cancer responded to serafinib, we've seen these type of responses. This patient's been on the trial over two years with a complete response to, to, to vemurafenib in the setting um, of a BRAF V600E mutation, the overall response rate is about 40-something percent. So again, not all these patients respond. Some of them um, respond. And this is Erdheim Chester disease. This is two patients. This is a woman who had skin disease. This is actually a cancer that 20 years ago, we weren't even sure if it was a cancer. It was maybe a, you know, uh, you know, autoimmune disease, or maybe it was a cancer. It wasn't quite clear. You had this histiocytic infiltration. Well, 50% of these patients have BRAF V600E mutations. Notably, 25% of them have the similar type MEK1 deletions that I showed you in that ovarian cancer patient. That's yet to be tested in the clinic, but that's another uh, significant population, only published um, in the last year, that those MEK1 mutations exist. So this is a woman who's had a complete response on this therapy. We've actually never had anyone who didn't respond with this treatment to vemurafenib, and we've actually never had a patient progress on the therapy. Um, with Erdheim uh, Chester disease. They all respond, they respond durably. We've had some patients come off due to toxicity. It can sometimes be a slowly progressive disease, and at some point they say, I want a break um, from the therapy. Um, I, I like pointing out this case. This is a woman who actually presented in a wheelchair who had cerebellar infiltration um, of the uh, Erdheim Chester disease. So these, these histiocytes, for some reason, can go um, pretty much everywhere. So she went ahead and went on the trial, has had a complete response, you can see here. Um, been on about a couple of years to get a very interesting YouTube video um, that you can watch um, on, the, uh, uh, you know, on, on the video uh, internet channel. Um, but the reason I point this out is that you know, we actually um, tried to bill, um, so related to John's talk you just heard, tried to bill for this um, BRAF testing in this woman. It got rejected um, by the insurance company. So um, they actually rejected um, this BRAF testing because they said it's not standard of care. So that really is the dilemma. You've got these type of responses. We need to find those patients, and how do we find them if, if we can't um, bill for them? So why do I like the basket study? Again, I'm a clinician, but I'm also you know, a laboratory investigator, and I like the idea that you can test a defined biologic hypothesis. There's nothing more infuriating than being a laboratory person working years in a very interesting hypothesis and not being able to do that clinical trial um, in, in patients. So this allows you to really test those hypotheses, such as do patients with BRAF mutations respond to vemurafenib? They always don't have to be complicated ideas. Does lineage matter? So is the response rate different in colorectal cancer versus lung versus histiocytosis? Clearly, um, that's, that's the case. Does the specific mutant allele matter? Uh, I'll get to this with neuratinib. 
We can collect tissue in these patients, study the, you know, why, why we see these heterogeneity of response. We can do a co-clinical trial concept that I'll mention to you in a second, and then I think they're very flexible. You've got this other arm. You can enroll patients that you might not have thought going into the study um, might have been sensitive. So we've gone out and we've looked for other examples of where a basket study um, could be useful. It's, it's not useful if it's 50% of the population. You don't need a basket study to test venurafenib and BRAF mutant melanoma. Those patients are not hard to find. You're looking for things that are rare. So this is the case of HER2 mutations, something we've ignored for a few years because we didn't have great technology to find them. But it turns out that about 1% to 5% of patients with a whole lot of cancers have these rare um, HER2 mutations. So we went ahead and we designed a basket study with a drug called neratinib. This was a drug that was thought to be not sufficiently active by Pfizer um, to warrant further development. So it was actually out licensed by a company um, called Puma that really said to us, you know, just design whatever clinical trial you think would be best and could most rapidly get this um, drug to market. So we actually went ahead and we designed a basket study. So you can have a HER2 mutation. And this company was incredibly flexible. It's very unusual. They let us put every HER2 mutation onto the trial, not just the ones that are known to be activating. And again, this is risky from the company's perspective because if you put on a bunch of passenger mutations, the response rate's going to be lower. If you restrict this to just the known activating mutations, maybe you're lo more likely to have a higher um, response rate. But they said, you know, go ahead and, and put them all on, and why don't we do this co-clinical trial concept that when you put them on, if it's a not a known activating mutation, we'll go ahead and make that allele in the lab. We'll ask, is it an activating mutation or not an activating mutation? And if it's not an activating mutation, maybe we replace that patient on the cohort, and we now know that information for the next patient who comes along with the same exact um, missense um, mutation. And we've seen some incredible responses. This is actually July of this year in this patient with breast cancer. This is a patient with ER positive disease, HER2 non-amplified, so we would call this HER2 normal, okay? So no fish amplification. Um, but the patient has a V77L mutation in the RBB2 gene. This is a, a, a mutation analogous to L858R, EGFR. So it's not shocking that we see this kind of response. Eight weeks later, this is September. Um, but we've got a woman on now almost a year with a complete response. And so we've seen some incredible responses um, to neratinib in this just very small subset of, of patients with breast cancer. It's about 1% um, of patients with breast cancer. The complicating factor here, unlike that um, study of, of the BRAF inhibitor, where we just let on patients with V600E, is though this issue of the different multiple alleles. And it's very possible that we'll see a better response with some of these mutants than with others. And so we've already uh, amended this study to do this. So we're going to take the breast cancer basket and we're actually going to subdivide it into different baskets. So we're going to have a breast cancer basket for people with V77L mutations, a breast cancer basket with S310F. And we're going to ask, you know, with each of these different alterations, we always have the other, we've got to have another. Um, so we're going to ask how many of these patients respond to the drug. And then ultimately, um, since there's probably only about 100 patients in the country with breast cancer and V77L mutations, maybe at any one time, can we ultimately find a, a mutation disease combination where the response rate and durability response is so high that it warrants an immediate change of practice? So this is such a small population when you've now broken it down by breast, only having HER2, and then only having this allele, um, that we would never be able to do um, a randomized clinical trial. So could we change practice? So what are the challenges with this approach? What, what are the criticisms we get? Well, the primary one I get, which I find infuriating, but I get it all the time, um, from clinicians, companies, regulators, is that we may fail to identify patients who may potentially respond but lack the biomarker being tested. So I, I completely admit it, it's true. So if you could respond to neratinib but you don't have a HER2 mutation, we're not going to be able to determine that with this study. It's completely true. And I'll tell you, companies really get hung up on this. Um, if I go back to actually a, f a few years ago, when I was toiling with the MEK inhibitor that wasn't as good as the ultimate RAF inhibitor, um, and we were trying to get a clinical trial going with Pfizer, um, we begged them to do a clinical trial of the MEK inhibitor in patients with BRAF mutations. And they would always look at me and say, you know, but wouldn't it be great if it worked in everyone, you know? I mean, it would be, you know? So, you know, it'd be great, but, you know, it's probably not going to work in everyone. We know that. Um, and then they would always say, you know, like, well, why don't we do the unselected trial first, and then if it's negative, then we'll do the selected population. What always happens is you do the unselected population. You see some toxicity. There's not that much activity, and they kill the program, like, every single time. So while this is a reasonable criticism, it's not the point of this study, and we're just trying to rapidly show the drug has any activity in any setting. 
Um, I call it the sad fact. This is getting multiple disease teams to work together has been a challenge. And this really gets down to the breast group wants to run a breast trial. The, the colon group wants to run a colon trial. The lung group wants to run a lung trial. And, and while that usually works out for lung and breast and colon, it's not great for non-Langerhans histiocytosis. Um, it doesn't work out usually for bladder or endometrial cancer. I, I, I actually presented this, this design um, to what we call a research council. This is the group of, uh, I guess, experts who are supposed to say this is a scientifically worthy trial. And one of the criticism I got from one of our very senior lymphoma doctors was that this, this type of trial was a fellow killer, okay? And I was like, what are you talking about? It's a fellow killer. And he, what, what he was implying was, was that, it, you know, we used to have 40 trials, you know, to do the same thing, but now we're just going to have one. So what is my fellow going to publish um, as a first author? And I just looked at him like, you've got to be kidding. I mean, we're not doing this trial to get your fellow, you know, a first author paper. Um, but we can get around this. You know, the way we've designed the Neratinib study is we're going to try not to publish one study, you know, to end them all or control them all, you know, um, that, that we're going to have a breast study that we can publish as a breast study, we can publish the lung study, we can publish the colon study. It's not dissimilar to what Keith's doing um, with the match study. So it, it doesn't have to kill the fellows um, to do the basket study. Um, and so what's the primary hurdle? The primary hurdle is identifying the patients. That's the challenge. And to me, and this is where I, I would clash with Keith a little bit here, to me, the screening protocol should be separated from the treatment protocol. This is an incredibly polarizing concept because it really gets down to if you don't have any way to screen for the patients, you want the screening to be provided for you. So if you go to institutions that don't have a giant eye of they say, well, I don't have giant eye of I need you to screen for me. And so it's got to be part of the therapeutic trial. But this really limits your ability um, to do these uh, type of studies. And so the question is, how are we going to find the patients? So what are we doing at Sloan Kettering? Um, not dissimilar to what Foundation Medicine's doing. We're doing a capture-based approach. The key for us for this technology is to try to keep the cost down. So if we want to screen everyone, we need a cheap uh, you know, uh, technology. And what this allows us to do is actually barcode fragmented DNA, mix it all together, sequence many patients you know, in the same reaction, and so keep the cost down. And by capturing just the coding regions, so the parts of the genome um, that we think are most important, actually there's a lot of some non-coding regions um, within this assay to pick up selected translocations, or for example, the TERP promoter, we can keep um, the cost um, down. So this is our current assay. We now have New York State approval for this. It's 341 genes. We're about to jump to an assay with about 410 as soon as New York State allows us to do this. I would credit Mike Berger for essentially doing all the work and getting this up and running with people like uh, Mark Aldani and Mirar Silla who run our uh, CLIA lab. Um, this is what's on the assay. I eventually added this slide because people kept asking me. We've got certain intronic regions, TERP promoter, We've got tiling probes to help with copy number. Um, but I'm happy, you know, we're pretty open with this, happy to share um, the assay design with anyone who might be interested. So as head of this um, Center for Molecular Oncology, we uh, initiated this initiative, very simple plan. We want to define the molecular driver of every patient. You know, let's just find the molecular driver in everyone. And we're going to start with the 12,000 patients a year or so that we see with recurrent um, metastatic disease. Um, we are using an assay that is doing both tumor and normal. And by doing the normal, we're one of the few institutions that actually is taking on that, that challenge. It really has to do with consent um, that you've heard from some of the questions earlier. Um, we could identify um, germline variants, and I'll show you this a little bit in a second, um, that contribute to cancer initiation. So again, what's the major hurdle? The major hurdle is that genotyping of any kind is standard of care for only six adult solid tumors. And those are lung, colon, melanoma, GIST, thyroid, and glioblastoma. So we can bill for at least something for those tumors. We can't bill for any of the other cancers. So how are we going to accomplish this goal? Well, we got to run a clinical trial. This is research. You got to have a clinical trial. So we went ahead and we wrote a clinical trial, um, IRB 12245, um, which allows us to do research non-billable testing and report the results into the clinical chart, as long as that was done um, in a CLIA lab. So we've initiated that program. What is, what, what I, one thing I think is pretty unique about this um, is actually we're making this data, this genetic data with the associated clinical data immediately available to every single person at Sloan Kettering right away. And this was a little controversial um, because people wanted to hold the data back saying, well, let's try to publish something first before we sort of give out all the secrets. And, and to me, I, I don't understand that because um, I don't think there's that many secrets there anyway, um, because again, there's a lot of sequencing already out there in a retrospective fashion. We might find a few things that haven't been um, previously described that might be interesting 
um, to do functional um, validation on. But again, the purpose of this study is to find patients for clinical trials and how better to encourage the clinicians to do clinical trials than to give them access to the clinical data with the associated mutation data to know what clinical trials they ultimately need to do. So we're using um, sort of a private internal version of the CBIO portal to do this. People might be very familiar to this. It's a very easy to use tool to mine the TCGA and other published genetic data. So if you go into this private version of the portal, you select DMP impact, um, clinical runs, um, you essentially end up um, with this page. You can click on the summary. And essentially, when I made this slide, we had already done 1,542 samples from 1,500, or I can't even read it here, eight uh, patients. And we're doing about uh, 100, 150 samples um, a week at this point, sort of about halfway to our goal to do about um, a rate of 10,000 a year. And here's the cancers that have been done. Um, you can actually click on, for example, breast cancer. Uh, actually, I made this a lot uh, bigger so you could see it in the back. Um, and then you can actually um, see I'm clicking on breast cancer here. And then you can actually type in some genes and actually how many have we found. So how many HER2 mutations have we found, pick through CA, P53. See, actually, their overlap. So each you know, column is essentially individual patient. The genes are here. These are amplifications. Um, these are missense mutations. And you can see there are some patients with HER2 amplifications with concurrent PIK3CA and P53 mutations. And you can actually click on one of those patients and actually bring up you know, their, their, their entire list of mutations. So you can see this patient has a PIK3CA E545K mutation with a nonsense P53 and a couple other mutations that I'm not really sure exactly what they mean. You can actually click on this button, pull down some of their clinical data. This is a 38-year-old woman with breast cancer, invasive ductal and lobby. She's living at 30-something months, and then here's some other clinical information about her. So we're making this data, again, open to anyone at Sloan Kettering. We don't really see that, um, again, we've got consent, we think, um, to, to make this um, in a HIPAA-compliant way available to our investigators, and ultimately, we think that we can um, publish this and make this publicly available. Um, when you start genotyping everyone, finding rare things becomes relatively easy. And so the, pro the reason there's no HER2 inhibitor approved for patients with breast cancer, it's not because HER2 is such a novel target, it's because we couldn't find any of the patients. And once you start screening, it's easy. So actually, here's just a partial list. I just took this screenshot, couldn't fit everyone onto, this, onto the same uh, screen of my Mac. Um, and you can see we've already found eight patients with this program with S310 mutations um, of HER2. Here's four with L55S mutations, um, three of them being breast, one endometrial. You can see the bladders more commonly have the extracellular domain mutation. So we're already seeing that the mutations are not evenly distributed in different cancers. They seem to associate with particular diseases. Maybe that has to do with the pathogenesis of a bladder cancer, which might be smoking related, um, versus a breast cancer, which might be inherited or due to some other um, toxin exposure. Um, one thing that actually took us by surprise, and I, I guess we, it shouldn't have, but, but it did, um, we, we simply weren't ready for it clinically, is this. Um, this is a foundation medicine report, a way many of the patients early in the trial were found, where the report comes back, and this was, I think, a woman with a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, the patient has a HER2 mutation, but there's this little thing that foundation put next to it called subclonal. And, you know, I actually called foundation and said, you know, what does that mean? Um, I, I know what it means, you know, when Gaddy is describing subclonal, but I have no idea what foundation means by subclonal. And they wouldn't tell me. It was, you know, it's like the secret sauce. They won't tell me what it really means. Um, but we do see these subclonal mutations, and we weren't really sure what, what to do with them. Um, would a patient who has a HER2 mutation in just some of their cancer cells respond um, to the HER2 inhibitor. Now, I had an out for this patient who actually was kind of distant and would have had to travel far you know, for the trial. I, I really didn't want to have them travel for something that wasn't going to work. Um, I had an out in that the patient also has an NF1 nonsense mutation. So the odds of, of a concurrent RAS you know, altered uh, you know, tumor responding to the HER2 inhibitor seems pretty low to me. But again, we weren't prepared for this and really had no policy on this study whether these patients um, should, you know, would be uh, acceptable. So are we seeing this? Um, well, you know, we can't really define clonality with any real certainty with the capture-based assay. We don't have enough events, and that's why I'm not really sure what foundation is using as a definition. Um, but here's a HER2 mutation. It's in a patient with breast cancer. Um, and there's two other mutations in this tumor. You can see the HER2 mutations in 58% of the alleles, and the other two are in uh, 27 and 26%. This is probably a clonal mutation where um, there's either some copy number gain or it's a homozygous mutation, and so you're seeing this, this two-to-one ratio. And so that's one that's probably clonal. But look at this patient here, and I again blew it up for you guys. This is a HER2 mutation 
where it's just in 3% of the mutant alleles. And you know, that could have been in and of itself just due to stromal contamination, but here's a TSC1 mutation that's found in 62% of the alleles. So in all likelihood, this is a subclonal HER2 mutation in a tumor where the TSC1 mutation came early and the HER2 mutation came late. So this is probably one of the reasons I'm not going to ever be the greatest clinical trialist, is that um, you, you just can't overthink these things. Um, we have no pro formal proof that subclonal HER2 her mutations don't respond. And it's even possible that this is the primary tumor in the MET, it's clonal. I don't know that either. And so sometimes you just, you can't do, know too much to run these clinical trials. You just have to just get the trial enrolled and then look at the data. You know, you love to take that patient-centric approach and just say, I'm gonna figure out what's best for every individual. You can't always do that um, in the clinic. Now, are TSC1s always early drivers, as, J as John implied, for, for example, with ALK in, uh, in lung cancer, and, and HER2 is sometimes late? Well, it's, it's really not clear, because here in TSC1 in bladder, another patient with bladder, here's a subclonal TSC1. So I showed you there was a patient who probably had an early um, clonal TSC1. Here's a patient with a later um, TSC1. Um, here's a patient with a HER2 just in one of the four tumors, pic 3 ca in two of them, um, and you can see things like the TERT and uh, this KMT2D in, in all of them. So again, we really haven't worked out the, the progression of these mutations in bladder cancer, but this issue of subclonality is going to be a big deal um, going forward. Does a patient who has a subclonal mutation, are they doomed to never respond to a target inhibitor? The answer is no. I love this case. This was actually a follow-up done by James Shea at our institution from our Everlimus extraordinary responder. This is a patient with kidney cancer who had a TSC1 mutation, had a multiple year response to Everlimus. And what was interesting is that when they went back and sampled different parts of the tumor, the TSC1 mutation was just in parts three and four, but it wasn't in parts one and two. But if you look in one and two, you actually find an mTOR kinase mutation that's activating and sensitive to the drug. So every clone within this tumor had a mutation that would sensitize you to, to Everolimus, but it was heterogeneous. Um, it was one mutation in one part of the tumor, another mutation in another part of the tumor. And so again, without knowing real perspective or retrospective clinical data on what any of this means, we just need to do clinical trials um, to really sort this out. Just a couple more points. One is um, a lot of the genes in the assay have germline importance, things like BRCA1 and BRCA2, and this has really been uh, an issue of consent. And so this is a rare patient who got Foundation One testing and MSKCC impacting. We've tried to discourage this. I would point out um, both assays called four alterations, but notably only one of them was shared um, between uh, the two assays. It was this P53 mutation. So the question is what happened up here? This patient had a missense ALK mutation and they actually suggested considering crizotinib, also a BRCA mutation. These mutations, it was clear why they weren't found. They actually weren't in the foundation medicine um, assay. So if you take a look at the raw data, it's clear what's going on. Um, this P53 is in the tumor. It's not in the normal, so we call it, and foundation calls it, because they just do tumor sequencing. They don't look at the normal. The BRCA is germline, so we actually filter it and are not currently reporting these back to our clinicians. So in the case of BRCA, we're actually hurting ourselves here because we're getting less information than foundation because we're filtering the germline data, which is clearly important. The ALK is actually germline as well. So here we're benefiting from doing the germline in that we can take this clearly missense SNP and we can say that it's almost certainly not important. Although Neil then always stands up and say, you really don't know that um, unless you make it. Um, but, but this is probably unimportant. So again, the downsides of doing the germline genotyping is this issue of now finding germline variants that are clearly pathogenic that we now have to report back to the patients and we, are we ready to do that? The benefits so that we can filter um, these uh, SNPs. Just one final point, um, the sequencing to me is not just going to select patients for targeted therapies. It's actually a patient of mine with prostate cancer, very aggressive course, primary metastatic disease, short response to hormonal therapy, went ahead and biopsied his metastatic disease. This was his uh, report in terms of the, the list of mutations. And what I would note is that he had truncating alterations in both MLH1 and MSH2 and a hypermutated tumor, which is pretty rare in prostate. Most of these tumors are pretty quiet mutationally. And so we actually tested his tumor for MMR deficiency. The reason we did this, and he was actually an MMR deficient hypermutated prostate cancer, is because we have a basket study that is open to people with MMR deficient tumors of any kind 
for the immunotherapy uh, PD-1, because there's been this correlation between hypermutation and response to immunotherapy. So this type of basket study opened up a trial for this patient he otherwise would not have been eligible for if we hadn't used this basket design. I mean, he was clearly in the other arm. We didn't expect prostate patients to show up with micro uh, unstable um, tumors. So, okay, so I'm just going to acknowledge a few people, in particular Gopa, who really was the fellow who's now a junior faculty member, um, who started this extraordinary responder initiative um, with me, my, my, my co-associate directors, uh, my associate directors of the uh, CMO, Mike, uh, Agnes, and Barry, Nikki, who runs the portal, Jose, who's really just said, you have to make this happen or I'm going to fire you, and, and so it's getting done. Um, and then uh, Dave Hyman, who, wor who wrote the 12245 protocol with me, um, and then many of our, our funding sources. So thank you. Hi. Um, since we're all doing disclosures, I guess I have to say my husband used to work for Foundation Medicine. Okay. But, um, I love I, those guys. <laughs> um, I was just curious, since this is becoming such a crowded space, like MGH is now advertising for their pet test, uh, usually during the commercial breaks at Jeopardy, and. Uh, a lot of other people are getting into this business. How do you uh, see patients figuring out which tests that they should use? Is that something the doctors I, need to figure out? or? I mean, the one thing I would say is I lose money every time we run this test. So I am more than happy to have Foundation Medicine or John or other people run some of these tests for us because all I want really is the information about the patient. So, you know, I'm a clinician. We're a nonprofit, although I guess we generate decent income. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I think th I'm just looking for as many HER2 mutants or BRAF mutants that I can find to enroll these clinical trials. I just want to get the testing done. So we're, we're not foundation medicine. We're not trying to corner the market and, and make money off of this. So uh, the question is, you know, I, I, I would say to patients, you're going to get w done what you can get done. I mean, we've had patients approach us and say, I'm not a patient at Sloan Kettering. Can I get my tumor and analyzed by impact? And the answer is no. I mean, you have to be a patient at Sloan Kettering um, to get this done. One, for financial reasons. We, we don't have enough money, really, even to do our own patients at this point. You know, we don't have clearly any money to do patients who are not patients at Sloan Kettering. Two is we have to consent patients for this. This is a clinical trial. And so I'll have patients contact me, and you know, I saw Dr. So-and-so once five years ago. You know, can I, can you test my tumor? It's sitting there at Memorial in your tumor bank. And I say, no, um, unless you consent, you know, for the clinical trial. Um, and we've actually tried to do male consents, make uh, buccal swabs a, a source of normal. Um, so we've tried to get over that. And it's not the optimal patient. We're not trying to consent patients who live in California who really couldn't go on the clinical trials anyway. But you know, if they were our patients, we're trying to, to, to accommodate that. So um, some of it is availability. And I think the downside of what's evolved right now is you're either a rich patient who sends the tumor to foundation or personal genome diagnostics, and you can afford to do that. Or you just happen to be lucky to be a patient at MGH and have John analyze your tumor, or you go to Memorial. Um, so there's clearly an, is an issue of access, that most patients don't have access to this. And I would make an estimate that 98% of patients with V77L HER2 mutations and breast cancer don't know they have a V77L HER2 mutation because their tumor's never been tested. And this is a real dilemma. Yeah, fantastic talk. The question is actually, it's a very basic one. Many years ago it was touched. The it's coming to melanoma, actually. So how many of those BRAF mutant patients have actually a MITF amplification? And if so, or if not so, actually, most of those inhibitors when you add, you, you see increased MITF. So there is an increased melanosome structures. And then you see the drug excluded from the cell. That's why they become more resistant. And going back to one more thing, like Minat Helen has shown like maybe five years ago, a single cancer stem cell can become a whole melanoma cell, actually, which I don't think it was touched for the last many years, actually. So is that, that explains the relapse or the uh, or coming back of the tumor in melanoma? And the so, third point, actually, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to cover everything. So you had like 394 genes there, and I know you touched RAT50, actually. That's, an, that's a very good thing. So did you ever look into the other epigenetic factors like the SMARC or the AZH2 complexes? Because the BRAF inhibitors have an effect on the SMART complex, which kind of induce a senescence phenotype in melanoma. So this is how I'm going to answer that question. I'm going to answer that question by saying, you know, you guys can invite me back to give the BRAF talk, because um, that's like a whole other talk. I think the BRAF story is very complicated. We've been working on BRAF resistance for a long time. We think coexisting mutations is part of the story. We published uh, the initial report that splice variants of BRAF are a cause of acquired resistance. Um, there's clearly uh, heterogeneity um, within melanoma. So it's very complicated. 
I, I don't know the answer to most of your questions, but I think that, that the sum of BRAF resistance is generally, it's 90% of the time you reactivate the pathway um, due to NRAS mutation, a splice variant, um, or a MEK1 mutation. Um, or a couple other things, uh, BRAF amplification, only about 10 or 15% is it some outside the pathway alteration like IGF-1R. Um, and that, there was a paper from Minar and Herlin on that in cancer cell a few years ago, but again, not the topic of this talk, and I'm just gonna leave it at that. It's very complicated, yeah. But that comes back to this question, right? All those BRAF are make inhibitors go back and down, uh, activate a downstream pathway, right? Yeah. So you, th you have the BRAF, CRAF, ARAF shuttling, actually, or the dimer formation. But I'll, the downstream I'll probably best talk to you afterwards. Very complicated. Uh, hi, very nice talk, and uh, certainly very important to look for mutations from, you know, extraordinary sort of responders. But you know, all well, your data you're showing is like it's distributing them patients to different treatments based uh, on the specific mutations that you find. With, you know, also the particular thing that you showed in that patient that there is also an importance in the clonogenicity of the mutation. So, and my question is, can this type of studies be used for much more complicated analysis, identifying the non-mutation that allows sensitivity to the treatment. So you can actually bring some of the, you know, healthy part of their genotype to other people because you'll never use, this, you know, you're not gonna go, well, RAD50 increases your sensitivity to this drug, let's, you know, mutate this gene in other cancer patients so they will be all be sensitive. So how do we, you know, you understand my question? So I, I think that, I, I think the, issue really comes down to functional genomics and and we're going to be spending many many years trying to figure out the functionality of each of these alleles and the only thing we're doing different than what someone might be doing if they're just randomly making all the alleles so you could make a library an orf library with every mutation and do the functionality that way but you might be studying studying mutations that are not uh, available in not actually present in patients and you might, you don't have the response data. And so, it, you know, all we're doing is just sort of adding the layer on top of it. If we know some response data about a particular patient, that may inform um, some of these alleles. In terms of the clonality thing, the, the problem to do the clonality studies right now is that you need whole exome or better data to do clonality. You need enough events to be able to estimate the clonality of every particular mutation. So when you only have six or seven mutation calls in our 341 gene assay, there's not enough data to know whether they're clonal or not. Because because the allele frequency, which is what we get from the data, um, incorporates both stromal contamination, local copy number variation, and then the clonality of that mutation within the tumor cell population. And if you've only got five events, you can't make that call. If you've got whole exome data, you can, but whole exome is still very expensive and not really available broadly in the clinic. But as the technology gets better, I think we're all gonna look back and say, okay, it's obvious why this patient didn't respond. Um, they had a subclonal HER2 mutation and a KRAS mutation, and clearly they had no chance. But the question, the ethical question I think we, we face right now as people who run clinical trials is, since I don't know that's true or not, should I not enroll that patient onto the study? Because I'm never really gonna be able to prove it unless I try. Yeah. And so from the patient's perspective, you know, you hate to be the guinea pig. You hate to be the person where you're gonna determine that. But as a society, if we don't enroll some of those patients onto these clinical trials, we're never gonna get an answer. And sometimes we're wrong, you know, sometimes you know, we, we find, you know, someone could predict, oh, this is an ER positive HER2 mutant tumor. Well, the, unless you're also hitting the ER, you know, at the same time, why would the patient respond to neuronin? But they did. Um, and we find actually that BRAF tumors with P10 loss seem to find, respond pretty good to vemurafenib. Maybe not as well as they would if you also inhibited AKT, but from the lab you would say, okay, that's a bad idea. But we do see activity in the clinic. So in the end, we've got to do clinical trials. We've got to do them more efficiently. Um, and that's really what I'm trying to get done.